Conway, who did an outstanding job with the announcements. Man, he, he sang that song to us today. It was beautiful. And then we do have to give it up for the Rodriguez's, and particularly Salma, who did such an incredible job sharing her heart and her life and her convictions for communion today. And then a huge thank you to Kip McKean, who guided us in contribution and showed us all that God is doing around the world. Isn't it not awesome? to see what God is doing in his modern day movement. You know, I hope you appreciate the GNN because I remember way back when, when we were in Portland and we used to do a, a, a hand mailer of the bulletin that they would do it over at my house actually. It'd be after church on Sunday and you have maybe 15 people come together and we'd have the bulletin that we'd have to fold into halves and then put into envelopes and we'd have a mailing list that we'd mail that bulletin all over the world. And every week we used to do that. That then turned into the good news email that Kip did for years and years and years and it took him hours upon hours upon hours to make that good news email excellent. And now we have the Good News Network. So I hope you're fired up and you know how much work goes into showing you all that God is doing around the world. Are you guys fired up about the good news? Amen. Well, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 22. I'm glad you guys are fired up today because, you know, I, I believe in transparency. And I want to be transparent with you right now. Uh, I have a challenging lesson for you today. It's going to challenge you. It's going to convict you. But, you know, the, the Bible, has, there's, it's been said the Bible has been challenged and not proven wrong. It's been challenged and proven challenging. Yeah. And so we're going to get into the Bible and we're going to have a challenging lesson from it. Let's turn here to Matthew 22 and verse 34. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your minds. You know, here, it, 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 they try to distill down. They go, okay. What is the most important thing to do? You know, we like this in life. We like to expedite things. We like to streamline processes. And here the, the Pharisees, they try and streamline getting to heaven and pleasing God. They go, okay, what's the most important thing? He goes, I don't know if you're ready for the answer. Here's the answer. you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You know, I was reading the other day what people view their most valuable possessions as. And there was a whole range of things, but many people would say, hey, my most valuable possessions are my house, my car, and maybe my savings account. Maybe some of us can't relate with that last one right there. But they say, these are my most valuable possessions here on earth. No, no, no. Let me tell you what your greatest possession that you have here this morning. It's your heart, it's your mind, and it's your soul. It makes up the human spirit, and God has given them to us. And what the scripture is about is who's going to then give that which God has given you back to God and give them all your mind, all your heart, and all of your soul. This is the whole purpose of man. You know, I've had the uh, pleasure and privilege of serving as evangelist for, for about 10 years now. And there have been a couple pivotal lessons that were just so important in that time period. And one of them was called Free Your Mind. That I preached, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And then I, I said, you know, okay, we've talked about Free Your Mind. And then years later, I wrote a lesson called Free Your Heart. But it dawned on me when I read this passage, 
I never got into the soul bit. And so today, we're going to talk about heart, mind, and soul. But if we are to give these things back to God, they must first be unchained. They must be unshackled. They must be freed so that we can give them to God. So we're going to have a holistic lesson today. And the title of it is Spiritual Freedom. You know, this is the message of Jesus Christ. In, Ma in Isaiah 61, prophecy about Jesus, it said he came to proclaim freedom for the captives. In Galatians 5, talking about Jesus after his life, it says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. So Jesus came to free us. But it wasn't a, a, a physical freedom. It was a spiritual freedom. And the th three things that he is freeing is the, the trinity of spiritual freedom is heart, mind, and soul. How is he going to do it? Well, in James 1, it says, if you perfectly, if you look into the perfect law, that gives freedom. So this right here, it can free your soul. It talks about in Psalm 119, it says, we will walk about in freedom for I have sought your precepts. And Jesus said, the truth will set you free. So today, this could just be an ordinary Bible study for you. The words can fall down to the ground empty. Or they could be the very words that unlock your soul and allow you to give it back to God in an incredible way. You know, Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from being extinct. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed down to them to do the same. And today in this lesson, this is what we are doing. We are fighting for spiritual freedom so that one day our children and our children's children can have the opportunities that we have in the kingdom of God. Are you guys with me this morning? I got three points for you if you haven't guessed it. My first point, number one, is free your minds. You know, it's kind of amazing if, if you look at in the Old Testament in heart and soul, they're always combined together. In fact, almost every time in the Old Testament it says the word soul, it has heart before it, heart and soul. But Jesus goes a little bit further and he adds mind to it, adding to what was written in the Old Testament. Let's dive into this. Go over here to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. It's a wild scripture. In verse 14 it says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. <laughs> now... If I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me, and that is doing it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work in the members of my body. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So then I myself in my mind a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature am a slave to the law of sin. Wow, what a crazy scripture. Quite confusing. What this scripture is entailing in what we would call enslavement. 
He goes, wow, I want to do good. You ever felt like that? You go, you have a plan for the day? You're going to get up at this time. You're going to have that quiet time. Then you're going to go share your faith. And then you got this and you got that. You got all these great plans. And as soon as your feet hit the floor, as you get out of your bed, you have good right there. But evil is right there with you. And as you start to put one foot in front of the other, there's this cosmic struggle of good and evil in your life. And you know the good you want to do, but sin is right there that wants to trip you up every step of the way. And they go, so we have this law at work, this law of having a sinful nature. Yet people, we're way too into organics these days. We want organic fruits and organic vegetables and organic meats, and we want organic things. Let me tell you what, not everything organic is good. Cancer's organic. You don't want some of that. Tornadoes are organic. You don't want one of them to come across your home. And we have a sinful nature at work. It's a law at work in the members of our body. And here this conundrum of sin is what we see being lived out in our society today. It's terrorizing. It drives us crazy, actually. You know, 25% of Americans are seeking mental health treatments. And I believe in mental health, and I believe there's a hereditary aspect to these different things, and I grew up with a lot of it. But man, a lot of people going and seeing counseling, a lot of counseling is just to help me figure out the conundrum of my sin. Help me try and figure this out. It's so confusing to me. At this point, the amount of people who are seeking counseling therapy has gone up in America by 5% this year. This year, it's exploding. Right now, we have 50 million Americans going to help get people to help them figure out the conundrum of sin. It's literally a maze of sin, and many people, we find ourselves completely lost in it. And we come to these points where we need to get put on the right path. How can we get out of this maze? How can we get clarity? How can we get on that narrow road that clearly shows us where to go? Well, let's keep reading in the passage in verse 5 in chapter 8. It says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace The sinful mind is hostile towards God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature can not please God. So here, what's the key? We have to be freed mentally. We have to be freed from having our mind set on a sinful nature to then ripped away to set our mind on pleasing God. You know, it talks about this in Ephesians 2. It says, all of us lived at one time among them, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. I don't know about you, but before I became a disciple, that was my life. I was totally committed, totally sold out, very focused on my sinful nature. I spent all my time, all my money, every resource I had to please it. And all that happened was somebody came and showed me the Bible one day, almost 25 years ago this year, showed me the Bible and said, no, no, you're going this way. You've got to go that way. The Bible freed me. It freed my soul. It freed my mind. And I was able to set my mind on pleasing God. You know, French historian Voltaire said, it is difficult for fools, for fools for, to be freed from chains that they revere. And that's what is so difficult is that at the end of the day, we want freedom of this stuff, but we kind of don't want freedom from it. We revere it. It's what all the Hollywood movies told us was so awesome. It's what all the music videos told us we should have. It's what everybody at UCLA or USC thinks is so great in this life is to please your sinful nature. He wow. says it's very hard to free people who revere their chains. And today, we need to rip ourselves away and set our minds 
I'm pleasing God through his words. A pretty smart man, Albert Einstein, said, freedom in any case is only possible by constantly struggling for it. If you're a disciple and you came in here struggling this morning, you're doing just what you should be doing. Because you're trying to live a life of true spiritual freedom. It's going to come through a constant struggle going, no, no, no. I spent enough time going that way. I know where that road leads. I'm going to go the way less traveled. I'm going to go down the narrow path. And I'm going to free my mind and follow Jesus Christ. So the question would be, how do I know my mind has been spiritually liberated? Well, it kind of gives us the evidence in this passage. It it says those who have their minds freed have their minds set on what God desires. What is your mind set on? What is governing your mind? What is controlling your life? And then it goes, those who aren't set on this, this message is hostile to them. You got to ask yourself, does this message bother you? If this message bothers you, then maybe that's evidence from the Bible, not me. I'm just a guy up here preaching the Bible to you. (laughs) Maybe the Bible is showing you is that you don't have your mind set on Christ. And you need to be freed mentally today. You know, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30. It says that because taking communion in, in, in pure matter it says this is why many of you are weak sick and number of you have fallen asleep you know I was thinking about this this last week the difference between falling asleep and falling away and you can actually be asleep in the church but you haven't quite fallen away Jesus talks about this in Revelation 3 he says but if you do not wake up I will come like a thief and you will not know what time I come Implying that if you're asleep and you don't wake up, man, you're eventually going to fall away because you don't know when Jesus is going to come back. You know, when you're asleep, you don't want to wake up a lot of times. I was asleep last night and my dog, for some strange reason, started barking in the middle of the night. And I immediately got up and I have to like keep myself together to not get upset. Because when you're sleeping, you don't like somebody to wake you up. You know, I started thinking and studying a bit about sleep this morning. And there's two types of sleep. There's one that's called SWS, which is slow wave sleep. And there's the more known one, which is REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. And the two have two different effects upon the mind and the body. When you're in slow wave sleep, your heart rate is declined. When you're in REM sleep, your heart rate actually goes up. Your respiration in when you're in slow wave sleep declines. Also, your body temperature declines. Your brain temperature declines. And your blood flow gets reduced. All of these things get heightened when you're in REM sleep. Also, your cognitive state, when you're in slow wave sleep, you have vague thoughts. When you're in REM sleep, you have vivid dreams that are well organized. And I believe that these are two groups that are here today. We have some people that are in slow wave sleep that everything's reduced, your, your temperature's reduced, you're not on fire, your heart rate has gone down, you're not having great dreams, but you have a vague decrease of thinking, and you're just sleepy. And there's some of us that are in REM sleep, you got rapid eye movement, you got incredible dreams, you're on fire for God, what are you doing here today? What kind of sleep you having? I think it's going to show on what's going on with the freedom of your minds. You know, it says in 1 Thessalonians, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us awake and be sober. You know, here's a challenge I, I want to give you t- today. There are many scriptures that talk about the mind in the Bible. Study them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Study out the mind in the Bible. 
See what God wants to teach you. Scriptures like Colossians 3, 2, where it says, set your mind on things above. Isn't that amazing? You can actually take your mind from all the things of this world and set them on things above. The Bible wouldn't call you to do something you couldn't do. You could do it. You could control your mind. You could take captive your thoughts. In Romans 12, it says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Wow, as a disciple, you come to glass ceilings that you're going to burst through and you're going to be renewed again and again and again. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. Wow. You know, I'll never forget when I preached the free your mind lesson when Sarah and I first got to San Francisco. There was 50 some people in San Francisco. They had had a handful of baptisms in two years and it become a very sleepy group. I'll never forget the first time we had a staff meeting, I did accountability and we said, hey, how many predictions we have for the week? And Cindy Oaks admits it now that she kind of laughed because they didn't think you could baptize somebody in a week. They thought it took months and months and months to baptize somebody. And in that staff meeting, I showed a clip from one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. And it's known as the Kung Fu clip where Morpheus is trying to free Neo, who's been plugged in the matrix and has had his mind enslaved for all of his existence. And so they're starting a fight in this kung fu simulator, and Morpheus is beating up Neo, and finally he kicks him into a wooden pillar like that and breaks the pillar, and then Neo is exhausted, and he goes, how am I able to beat you? He goes, you're too fast. Morpheus says, do you believe that I being stronger or faster has anything to do with my muscles in this place, being in a computer simulator? He goes, do you think that's air that you're breathing? And then he goes, again. And they start to fight again. And now Neo's starting again. He's starting to move fast where he's like, you can see his hands going like this. And the dude's like, and finally he gets it where he's able to hit Morpheus. And then Neo says to him, he goes, I know what you're trying to do. He goes, I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. It's you who must walk through it. I showed that clip to the staff. I said, the time of my lesson is free your mind. And as we preached that lesson, you saw the faith come back into the disciples. And as they started to rise back up, I ended with those same words. I know what you're saying, Jason. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get us to believe that we can be fruitful again, that this church can forcefully advance, that God's promises are still true, that we can evangelize the world. I know what you're trying to do. I go, I'm trying to free your mind. But I only can show you the door. It's you who must walk through it. You know, there was a, a wonderful woman that was in that meeting. Her name was J.L. Cook. Yeah. Now Ellison. And J.L. had come on the original planting to San Francisco, and she was pretty hurt and beat down. And I never forget seeing J.L.'s just posture change in that lesson. And it became a personal mission of Sarah and I to helped Jill raise up because she was a, such a talented young lady and her heart was hurt because she wasn't married and so I said to her I made a commitment to her that day I said sis we're gonna find you a husband <laughs> and joking with her I said sis I do this full time for a living I'm clocking in <laughs> we're finding you a husband <laughs> and I'll never forget maybe a year or so later a young man studied the Bible Tyree Ellison And under great persecution, he made a decision to become a true disciple and he got baptized. And right after he got baptized, I told Jill, I said, that's your husband. We just got to make it happen now. Years later, they engaged. And at the rehearsal dinner, I shared, I said, hey, sis, after you get married tomorrow, I just want to let you know, I'm clocking out. And it was just so incredible to see JL free her mind that God could do great things in her life. And now she's married with a beautiful daughter and they're leading their dream ministry in Oakland, California. 
God is calling you to free your mind today. But I can only show you the door. You got to make a decision to walk through it. My second point for you today is free your heart. You know, someone once said, to start a war takes conviction. To win a war takes heart. And we've started a war around the world. We're planting 32 churches this year. We're raising millions and millions of dollars to do it. People, like you saw on the GNN, are, are, are laying down careers of being a doctor and going into the full-time ministry. People are going to lands that they don't know how to speak the language. We just had a mission team go to Bangkok, Thailand. You know how many of them speak Thai? None of them speak the language. They're going to go there and figure it out because they believe that this is a war against the forces of darkness. And our convictions have made us launch this war. That we believe there needs to be restoration of primitive biblical Christianity all around the world. But it's going to take great heart to finish it. I believe we've got to fight for all of our hearts. Let's turn over here to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. It says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll come, back to, I'll come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you'll call upon me and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me. And find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I'll be found by you, declares the Lord. You know, right now as we sit here in this building, there is a cosmic battle raging. This struggle is between good and evil. Against the forces of darkness and the kingdom of light. This war is being fought not for land and territory. This war is being fought not for power and position. This war is being fought for one thing only, the human heart. And it's happening right now. And here, God gave us a promise that should be all that we would ever need. He says, I know you feel hurt. Can you imagine how the Israelites felt here? They're in captivity. They've been destroyed as a civilization. And even in that, God says, I have a plan for you. It's not to harm you. Maybe you feel harmed. Maybe you feel like this world is beating you down. Maybe you feel like society is beating you down. The, the family you're born into is super rough. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe you've been mistreated. The scripture still reads the same. And here's God's message for your hurting heart this morning. I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future in this dark world. But here's the caveat. You can only find me if you seek me with all your hearts. How sad it is. How sad it is. We could go anywhere and see people that could get a golden ticket today, could get the great inheritance that man could ever ask for, but few find this great treasure because few are willing to give God all their heart. See, here's the, the tough thing about it, is that God will only accept all of your heart, but Satan does not make such requests. He does not demand all your heart. He will, he's fine with 10%. He's fine with 20%. He would be thrilled if you'd give him 50, if you'd be one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. He'd be very happy with that. This is why even Satan took Jesus up to the highest point in the temple and showed him all the kingdoms. He's saying, hey, you could be at the highest point in the church and, and, and have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and you could actually, everybody will think you're awesome, but you're really worshiping me. I just want some of it. But God wants all of the human hearts. You know, I started looking at heart disease. 
One of the number one causes of heart disease is an unhealthy diet. Now, Jesus said in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So when you're not eating the food of Jesus and doing God's will, you start to have an unhealthy diet and you start to get heart disease spiritually. The other one is physical inactivity. When you're not running the good race, when you're not training in righteousness and getting taught, rebuke, correct, and train and letting people in your life to disciple you and you become inactive spiritually, wow, you start to get heart disease in the kingdom. I believe there's a major reason that kills our hearts spiritually and it's called empty, worthless religion. Wow. Let's turn over here to Ezekiel chapter 33. I, hey, I told you I had a tough lesson for you today. I'm being transparent. Let's look here at Ezekiel 33. In verse 30. It says, As for you, Ezekiel 33, 30. As for you, son of man, your countrymen are talking together about you. By the walls and the doors of the houses, saying to each other, Come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words and do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. What is this scripture detailing? Empty assembly worship. I started watching a documentary on Netflix about Hillsong. And this is a, a, a church that has cracked the code. If we want people to come to our services, our marketing scheme is terrible in the ICC. We got a really bad marketing scheme. We sit down with you and show you the Bible first. <laughs> That's the first thing we do. And then we actually show you all the very uncomfortable, you know, pivotal teachings of the Bible. And we don't just tell you to take this on as your own theology. We call you to actually do it. We call you to give up everything. Terrible marketing scheme. And then we count the cost with you even before we will baptize you so you can come and be a part of the member of the church. Hillsong figured out how to build a successful church as far as getting people there. This is what they do. They have one hour and about 45 minutes of it is like a spectator sport. It's a concert. It's incredible. I mean, the, the music is amazing. The smoke machines, the laser lights. They, they have a preacher up there who looks like Bono from U2 or something like that. I mean, it's incredible. He's got a $5,000 leather jacket on. It's amazing. And they planted a church in New York City in 2020. And by 2022, it went from just a planting to 150,000 people coming on Sundays. But then all the scandal and all the things started coming out of it. Because it was empty assembly worship. But here's the thing. Don't think that we can escape such a thing. Don't, th don't think that that can't be us. You know, I, I want to have a family talk with you. I, I, was, I was saddened last Sunday. I thought we had an incredible sweet 16 celebration of God's plan at this church here in City of Angels. And after I, I gave the lesson, I sat down for a second, I walked out into the hallway. And I even know what I saw. I saw a line of people lined up as long as this wall here. I didn't know what it was for. I thought maybe they were getting, a, a, that one sister was trying to sell Jamaican food, and I thought maybe they were signing up for an order. 
which wouldn't have been good. But I asked them, I said, what is this line for? They go, oh, it's people waiting to get their parking validated. And I said, oh, my gosh, the baptisms are happening. And like at a Clippers game when there's just minutes lay, left and they're down by 30 points, what happens to the bleachers? Everybody starts to walk out because they want to beat the traffic and get out of downtown as quickly as they possibly can. was the same thing I saw of people not wanting to wait around and, and see somebody get their soul saved in the waters of baptism. But instead found it a better use of their time to get their parking validated to save 10 bucks so they can beat the streak of cars trying to leave the complex. And all I thought of was Ezekiel 33. You know, I think God wants to really challenge us today. You, you could be involved in empty assembly worship. Is that what you came to today? Or does your, does your heart need to be freed? Does it need to be freed because it's just become our, we're going to come here, we're going to have three songs. I know one of these six people is going to do the welcome and, and then, you know, Ole's going to get up there and do announcements and they're going to say the same four or five different things and they're going to have somebody, Ole's going to sing, we love you, love the Lord, not very well, amen. And then we're going to you know, we're transition into communion and they're going to have the communion song and then one of the same eight people are going to get up there and do communion and they're going to say, well, this is what the communion means to me and then we're going to have contribution, they're going to call us to give our best to God, then we're going to take a break, this is going to be three minutes, going to be really bad, 10 minutes, then we'll have two callbacks. Jason's going to get there and give a lesson. It's going to really challenge me, but I'm just going to walk out and not do anything about it. And then Kip's going to do the close. It's going to be awesome. Is that what you came here today to? Or did you come with free hearts to give it back to God? But that's what we're here to do today. That we're here for spiritual freedom. The world is lost. The religious world is lost. And are we just going to blend into the white noise of the masses? Or are we going to dig down deep and go, you know what? i got to give my heart back to God. You know, at the Mercy Day, who here is the Mercy Ambassador? Mercy Ambassadors? All right, so uh, some of you didn't put up your hands, so maybe you don't know. If you become a disciple, you're also a Mercy Ambassador. And it makes sense that a lot of you didn't put your hand up because out of the 950 disciples we had in the church, only 330 showed up. Let me tell you what, you can't tell me that you're doing well spiritually and not be totally committed to God and his church. It's an impossibility. You cannot be doing well spiritually. And so some of us, we need to take a look at our hearts. It's not about me. It's not about Operation Jerusalem. or all. It's, it's about where your hearts are at with God. I will come. Who knows? I mean, Kip may send us to who knows where. God may call us to go. This is scripture is still going to read the same. Yeah. Have you given your hearts completely to God? You know, in the Matthew account of this passage, in the, I'm sorry, in the Mark account of the Matthew 22, it adds strength to it. It says heart, mind, soul, and strength. Why? Because there's a certain strength that is needed to be committed to God. I'm going to be honest with you. The mercy event, I was like, okay, self-denial time. Now it's time for self-denial. I don't always feel like doing all the things I got to do. The people who go, I don't feel like doing it, I don't do it, that just shows that you're unspiritual and immature. The people go, well, I really don't feel like doing this. All right, I got to deny myself and I put my convictions before how I'm feeling, no matter what the situation may be. And I go because it's God and his kingdom. That's free in your heart and give it to God. You know, Martin Luther King said, Freedom is never voluntarily given by an oppressor. It must be demanded by those who are oppressed. Satan's just not going to give it to you. You're going to go, no, I'm going to rip it away and take it. This is why Jesus, in his last lesson, he said, in this life you will have trouble. But take your heart back. Rip your heart back. Take heart, because Jesus overcame the world. 
What is it going to take for you to overcome the world? Maybe making decision today to rip your heart back and then give it back to your heavenly father. I got a challenge for you. There's about 150 scriptures that talk about the heart in the Bible. Study them out over the next weeks. Study out the heart and give it back to God. I have one final point for you today. Free your soul. Soul in the Greek is actually, it's, it's psyche. It stands for your animate self, which means your living self. It also means your inner self, and it also means the principle of life in the Greek. So your soul is your principle of life. What you do with your soul is the principal point of you being here on this planet. And God wants to free your mind. He wants to free your heart so that he can free your soul. You know, it says in Genesis 1 verse 26, and then God said, let us make man in our likeness. Us having a soul is what separates us from all other creatures. You're not called a creature. You're called a human being. The reason why you put a human being on it means that because you have a consciousness, you have a soul that is going to be the surviving thing when you breathe your last. What are you going to do with it? Let's look here at Matthew 16. Matthew 16. In verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he'll reward each person according to what he has done. You know, here it tells us what you should invest in in this world. You can get the whole world. You can get all your dreams that society told you that you should get. But do you know that the rich and poor kill themselves about almost equally? How many rock stars and movie stars and politicians and men of power and people of industry and all these things have to end their lives taken by themselves before we start going, you know what? Investing in this world is not a good investment of my soul. Here it says those who do it, they forfeit their soul. There's nothing sadder in the world than to see somebody quit. Yeah. You ever seen this happen in, in sports where they just, they couldn't compete. They had to forfeit. There's nothing that's like, wow, how could that happen? They just quit. They couldn't compete. And it says this is what happens when we don't go, no, no, I, I'm not going to care about the things of this world. I may get this. I may get that. I may have this dream. I may achieve that career. I may get that promotion. I may find a wife or a husband. I may have that beautiful day where I get married. I may graduate from this or have these achievements, but that's not what my life's about. I haven't bought into that lie. I'm not trapped in that rat race. You haven't blinded my mind with that. No, no, I'm investing in something that's far more important, that's far more yielding. I'm going to invest in what comes after this. And so I'm not worried about my life. Whatever happens, I know where I'm going. You know, if you're a disciple, you know who you are. You know what God wants you to do, and you know where you're going. Isn't that amazing? I know who I am. I know what I got to do, and I know where God is going to take me if I do it. You know, there's a person that was so special that for me and Sarah that Stephen Eady got appointed as evangelist and women's ministry leader last Sunday. And Stephen's a, an incredible son in the faith to me. Uh, he was invited out by a brother who's in our East region, uh, Aaron's in Dejas. And... Um, it was right during the pandemic, and we, we, we met up with Stephen. We started studying the Bible with Stephen. 
And this was immediately a super impressive guy who's playing college baseball. And he studies the Bible right, in, right when the pandemic started where we're like scared to go outside. Yeah. And so we had to sneak outside. Literally like we're whispering. When we asked him the question, it was like, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? And we're out by a pool. And Stephen studied the Bible. He made Jesus his Lord and he got baptized just three years ago. And right after he gets baptized, he goes, you know what? I believe God has put a dream in my heart that I want to be an evangelist one day. You always got to be careful when you say stuff like that. Because the very next day, he got a call from San Jose State. The baseball coach called him and said, hey, we want to give you a full ride scholarship to play baseball. And now he was really wrestling whether he wanted to go into full-time ministry. <laughs> so he calls me and he says, hey, bro, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I don't know. What, uh, I, I mean, what, what do I do? You know, I, I just got a full ride scholarship to play baseball at San Jose State. And we had a ministry there. So it wasn't like he was being asked to go somewhere where there was no ministry. And I said, well, bro, just go play baseball. Ole was leading the ministry there at that time, which brought some concern to me. But... <laughs> But I, I said, all right, go be with Ole, and it's awesome. It's awesome. And I remember I just got done with the conversation. I just didn't feel good about it. Not that there was anything wrong for him to go do that. But I said, this young man, I believe God's called him for the ministry. So I called Tyler Sears, who played football, D1 football, at U of O. And I asked him, what was it, what's it like being in that type of program? He says, very tough. So I called Stephen the next day, and I said, hey, bro, I believe God's called you in the ministry. If you want to go and play baseball, go do it. Fine, you're a disciple. God loves you. But I just would not be, I think, obeying my conscience if I did not say, I want you to come to Berkeley. We'll make you an intern. I believe one day you'll be an evangelist. And Stephen goes, I knew you were going to ask me to do this. <laughs> and he goes, and I have to do it. He called his coach that day and told him, I can't take the scholarship. I believe God's called me to be in the ministry. He gave up that scholarship. He came to Berkeley to be a part-time intern. And it was incredible to see somebody who, who could have had the world. He could have been a big leaguer. But he gave that up to invest in God's kingdom. And last Sunday, they got appointed as evangelist and women's ministry leader. You know, I, I believe that many, many times God is going to call us back to John 12, where Jesus says, my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this reason I came into this world. Glorify your name. Wow. And we have to surrender our souls again and again. And when you do that, you were fulfilling the words of Peter when he said you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Maybe today it's free your mind. Maybe it's free your heart. Maybe it's surrender your innermost being to God once again. And God will free your soul as, as it's never been before. You know, a secular hero of mine, Viktor Frankl, said this, and I'll leave you with this quote. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. You know, this is the space that every single one of us are in this morning. It's between the space of the stimulus of this lesson and your response. The question is, how are you going to respond? It means everything. Because in your response today, my brothers and sisters, is spiritual freedom. I love you guys very much. And to God be all the glory.